for most of those markers, I'm better than a 20 year old for, for health. And, uh, and I think a lot of that's due to my new diet that I've adopted because I can just see things getting better and better over time. Introducing Dr. David Sinclair, Harvard Medical School professor of genetics. Here is a comparison between Dr. Sinclair in 2013 and now. Even though he's 54 years old, he still seems younger to me. The professor has altered his lifestyle and his eating habits throughout the years. According to science, his body is younger. And I've looked at my blood biochemistry and I'm actually now younger and healthier than I've ever been since I've been measuring it over a decade. Now it's more like 14 years. And I can plot various parameters, testosterone, glucose, uh, the list goes on, inflammation, uh, blood type, blood cell composition. And uh, for most of those markers, I'm better than a 20 year old for, for health. In this video, we will get straight into his scientific discovery in five parts. First, the exercise rules to longevity. Second, most important eating habit to longevity. Third, the foods he eats for longevity. Fourth, the supplements he takes daily. Lastly, the foods he avoids for longevity. By living a healthy life, you can slow that rate of aging and prevent this, this corruption of the body software and even reboot it. Dr. Sinclair's advice on exercise is simple. Is to exercise three times a week um, and lose my breath. You want to be able to be moving so fast that you cannot carry out a conversation easily. That's when you know you're becoming hypoxic, low in oxygen. And this low oxygen, we think, is a very good stimulator of this stress on the body. And it, your body responds in a positive way to build muscle, get better blood flow, and also your tissues will put out chemicals that slow aging. So really, if you can just lose your breath for 10 minutes, three times a week, that can give remarkable health benefits, lowering the rates of disease by 30%. The most important eating habit for longevity is... Eat less often. It's not just what you eat, it's also when you eat. And this constant eating three meals a day plus snacks is making us age faster than we need to. I like to eat within a period of about six hours a day. Over time, learned to do is skip meals. I'm not always successful. Sometimes I have breakfast in, in beautiful places. But my goal is to not eat a large meal until dinner. Uh, and then I eat a very healthy vegan. What is the science underlying the advantages of time-restricted eating? Then? If you're down to one meal a day, which I am now, you shed weight and then you get your 20 year old body back. That's a nice bonus. It's the period of not eating that's so important for boosting the body's defenses against aging to maximize longevity. But these long extended periods are doing a real deep cleanse on the body and turning on that autophagy, that process of recycling proteins very deeply. There is a set of genes that I wrote about in, in my book, Lifespan, that's called the sirtuins. And they get turned on when there's not enough energy in the body. So if you don't have a lot of sugar in your bloodstream or a lot of protein, they will get turned on and they defend the body against the damage that causes the aging. Certain diseases, type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, even cancer, those diseases seem to also benefit from fasting, including when you combine chemotherapy with fasting, you get this double benefit for many types of cancers. Here is a practical tip from Dr. Sinclair for anyone who wants to start intermittent fasting. Trick is, <laughs> that you wanna fill your body with fluids. For me, mm -hmm. constant coffee, tea, hot water, all the way through the day, being hydrated and filled with liquid takes away any feeling of hunger. Also nuts, if you really are really, you need to eat something, a bit of protein is known to take away the feeling of hunger rapidly. You wanna have at least 16 hours of not eating or not eating very much. And then you can have eight hours. So typically that means having a late lunch if you skip breakfast, or if you prefer to skip dinner, uh, skip that. But that gives my body this long window, more than 20 hours of not having glucose circulating from the external world. Now, what happens when you do that, and it takes a few weeks for your body to adapt, is that your liver will learn how to compensate for lack of food. It's called gluconeogenesis. The generation of glucose from your liver, it actually overcomes the feeling of hunger. Do it for at least two weeks, because after the two week, especially by the three week mark, your liver has now learned that you're not gonna have breakfast or lunch. And it will start making glucose at a steady level. That's really important because it's known that if you have these spikes of glucose, it leads to hunger when it crashes after a big meal. So during the six hour span of eating window, what does Dr. Sinclair eat? I went almost completely to plants and my body has responded. I look better. I think my skin is better. I feel better. My memory is certainly better. You just look at those 
populations and people that live a long time, they are generally smaller yeah. women who yeah. don't eat much, who eat vegetarian. I mean, that's the fact we can. Does he consume any plants then? Instead, he concentrates on what he refers to as stress plants. The idea of xenohormesis is central to this development. According to this theory, some chemicals, like plant polyphenols, which show signs of stress in plants, may be advantageous to another organism that consumes them. By triggering the animal's cellular stress response, the anticipated advantages include increased longevity and fitness. Well, the xenohormesis concept, uh, Conrad Howitz and I coined this term in the mid-2000s, trying to explain why so many plant molecules are good for us. It just cannot be a coincidence. And we came up with this idea really prompted by a 2003 Nature paper that we co-published that found at least 20 plant molecules called polyphenols that activate the SIRT2 an enzyme called SIRT1. And when I looked into it, these polyphenols do remarkable things to the body. The one that got the most media attention because it's in red wine is resveratrol, but there's Pisciatanol and there's physetin and quercetin. These are supplements that people are getting excited about only now. But when you look into it, they activate and inhibit pathways or proteins in the body that are known to be important for health and longevity. So how do we know if a food has been stressed? Well, you can start with the generalization that if they're grown uh, out in a field organically without pesticides, probably they're more stressed, right? Just remember, <laughs> eat. if your food is stressed, then you get the benefits stress your food so you don't have to. And so what we focus on are plants that are full of color. So try to eat bright red and purple, uh, dark green colored vegetables because those are the ones that have these polyphenols that can turn on the body's defenses. And actually in my lab, if we give polyphenols to mice, they actually get healthier and run further like they've been exercising. You might be curious in the precise stress herbs that Dr. Sinclair consumes. Green tea, a stress-relieving beverage rich in polyphenols, is something Dr. Sinclair likes to drink in the morning. I drink matcha tea most mornings, which is the, the very thick, dark green, creamy green tea. ECGC from green tea. This ECGC has great anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. While he enjoys all kinds of different leafy greens, he specifically mentioned spinach. I eat a diet that's definitely full of leafy greens. Particularly spinach is great because it's got the iron that we need, plenty of vitamins. Olive oil, which is frequently used in Mediterranean cookery, works well for cooking. A lot of olive oil with oleic acid, which activates sirtuins as well. The Mediterranean diet is the one that I think is likely to be the, the easiest to do in the Western world and to have the biggest bang for the buck. Dr. Sinclair says the Okinawan or Mediterranean diets are good options for people who would find the fully vegetarian diet difficult to follow. He followed these diets for decades before switching to a plant-based diet. You were on the Okinawan diet for quite some time, right? Yeah, I was. It's mostly carbohydrate, so there's a fair amount of rice, but probably could have done better with a bit of brown mm -hmm. rice. White rice sends you glucose through the roof. Right. But mostly what I was eating were uh, Chinese and, or Japanese vegetables that I could get at the local market. So they're organic, fresh, green, full of vitamins, and soy. Mostly it was that. It was a plant-based, soy-based diet with a little bit of fish. Dr. Sinclair is frequently mentioned as recommending the use of three supplements. Please be aware that Dr. Sinclair is not endorsing any brand and does not endorse any before we examine it in further detail. He doesn't market any dietary supplements. New theory of aging. We used to think that antioxidants were the cure to aging. If you go to the supermarket, you'll still get a lot of that bull. It's not true. Antioxidants have been really unsuccessful at lengthening the lifespan of anything, even a worm. It doesn't work that well. Three things that you want to take consistently. I would take resveratrol. i take a gram with a bit of yogurt, NMN, and then metformin. I don't sell any supplements, by the way. Gotcha. I'm not making any money. Here. Okay, you well, I don't recommend anything. I'm gotcha. just a PhD. The one chemical that I take every day is resveratrol, which is the red wine chemical, and that comes from grapes. So that one gets sprinkled into some yogurt in the morning. NMN is a a version of vitamin B3 that makes a chemical in the body that we need for life, and that's called NAD. And as we get older, we make less and less of this. And without NAD, these sirtuins that we discovered, slow aging, remember the genes that we discovered? Mm -hmm. They don't work without a lot of NAD. So as we get older, our defenses decline. And so by taking this supplement, we know that it doubles the levels of NAD back to when I was age 20. There's now clinical trials that my colleagues at Harvard have done that says that NMN has some health benefits in early studies, such as lowering cholesterol and blood pressure. 
and so I take that one every day as well. Third one is metformin. Metformin is a little bit more controversial because it's a drug. It's just classified as a drug. That doesn't mean it's necessarily dangerous. In fact, it's a, one of the world's safest drugs. It's used for type 2 diabetes to s control blood sugar. And what's been found is that people who take metformin tend to live a lot longer. Even those who don't have type 2 diabetes, there's evidence that they are protected against cardiovascular disease and frailty and even Alzheimer's disease. Let's now examine the foods that Dr. Sinclair eliminated from his diet in order to live a long life. Sugar. The big killer is sugar. Glucose, particularly fructose, is also pernicious. And if you give animals lots of glucose, and especially fructose, they will get fatty liver disease, they'll get diabetes. It's really bad. The best predictor of your long-term longevity that we know of is your blood sugar. When you've got high blood sugar, it attaches to a lot of proteins in your body. You become caramelized. Cancer cells, by the way, love sugar. They live on sugar. And that's another reason why you should try to keep it low. Try to avoid too much fruit, berries, particularly fruit juice. Definitely avoid that sugar high. Spiking your sugar is not healthy in the long run. Your body can make its own sugar. Your liver makes sugar. You just need to wait two weeks for it to get used to it. Our liver is pretty lazy, but after two weeks it learns, ah, in the morning I have to make some sugar. And what, what I found is that my liver making sugar is a lot smarter than my eyes and my mouth eating sugar. There's even an order at which you can eat your meals to reduce the blood sugar spike. You can put the sugar at the end of the meal. You can quit something, but you don't have to be draconian about it. I still like to steal a, little, you know, a few scoops of ice cream if I see it, but I'm not going to eat a giant bowl of ice cream every night. We now know the importance of reducing sugar intake. However, we can choose healthier options if necessary. But there are substitutes. For example, monk fruit produces sugar. Agulose? Stevia is a big one. One item he has eliminated from his diet is bread, which falls under the sugar brand. First thing I cut out was a lot of carbohydrates. I used to eat bread every day. I would just put if I ate something, it would be on toast. Okay, that, that's my life. I cut that out and have found immediate improvements in my biochemistry levels, particularly my glucose levels. Is that if you eat a piece of toast for breakfast or, or heaven forbid, a, a giant glass of orange juice, you'll have this spike in sugar and you'll feel great. But then you, your body will put out too much insulin and suck that glucose out of your bloodstream and put you into a glucose deficit. And that's hypoglycemia. And then you're hungry. You've got ghrelin coming out into your body and you, you feel hungry and you need to eat something. I'm at a state though now where I don't get those rises and crashes. My liver is putting out glucose from when I wake up till dinner and I've never been so focused. I've never been so um, brain fog free because the, these crashes, what they do is they make you feel shaky or tired and brain fog. And I wish I'd done this in my twenties and done it my whole life because I've really never felt better because of it. The next thing I cut out was, uh, was meat. I, I worked towards a, a Mediterranean diet had, and I have a familial history, genetics of heart, heart disease. I have what's called LP little a, but though that was very important was the cutting out meat. And it's not just the protein. It's also the fat that comes along with the steak and whatever that I was eating. Well, I love meat. I would love to eat meat. They taste, it tastes really good. It's just the science says plants give you better bang for the buck for longevity than meat. The protein that's in plants is actually has a ratio of amino acids that stimulates these longevity genes, the sirtuins, and another one called mTOR. And if you always eat meat every meal, your body's just not fighting aging the way it could if you ate more plants. I mean, you can eat meat occasionally. Fish, for example, has a lot of great omega-3 fatty acids. So I'm not against meat. I just think try to focus more on plants if you can. Third change was the dairy. I did that just to see what would happen. I figured it wouldn't matter. I'm not allergic to dairy. I'm not lactose intolerant. But it did have an effect. It made things even better. And what I think is going on, Shane, is that I was eating a large amount of protein, not just fat, but eggs and all that stuff. And um, and now that I have less protein, I think that mTOR pathway that's really important for longevity um, in animals and probably people is really kicking in in a way that had never done so before. The new research just over the last two years says that drinking alcohol every day is, is really not good for you. So I've cut out alcohol and I've focused on plants. Here is one final film from Dr. Sinclair though, in case you are unable to give up your wine. In the case of red wine, Choose great varieties that are stress sensitive. Pinot Noir is one of the most sensitive, if not the most sensitive, great variety. And that's why it has the most resveratrol of any other type of wine.